Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> it's great to have everyone here this morning. Uh, I will be moving around a little bit. I'll try to stay in the frame. Um, I just feel like I'm so far away from everybody. I want to jump down, but um, what's that? You can come up here, yeah. We'll put some chairs up here. Um, we're starting a new quarter, a new class. Uh, as the screen so says, we're going to do a survey of the letters of Paul. And so this class will be a little bit uh, less, I guess, less detailed than a thorough dive into each letter spending weeks on each letter, we're just going to spend one Sunday on every single letter. And so it's, it's going to take us the next several weeks to go through this. Uh, I will be beginning this class, and then we've got a couple other teachers who are going to take over in July and in August to teach the other letters that uh, we'll be covering. And we're going to try to do this as best as we know, as best as we can, in the order that they were written. And so they won't be in the order that they're in your Bible. They'll be the order that they were thought to be written in. Uh, there is some, some different ideas about that. We're going to do our best uh, to go through that. Um, before I get started, I need a volunteer to walk around with a microphone because uh, we're going to have a lot of interaction, and we want to make sure everybody can hear. Jim, are you going to do that for us? Thank you, Jim. He does such a good job of that. <laughs> it's right up here on the table. Um, but before we begin, let's, let's start with a prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, for this wonderful Sunday that we get to come together and, and worship and in fellowship, to encourage one another and to lift up your name. And uh, I pray as we go through this, this class, this survey of the different letters that Paul wrote, that we would be able to learn something about the reasons why he wrote these things, uh, these letters, and why he would write to his friends and, and the people that he, the churches that he knew about. And what encouragement we can draw from that. Help us to be encouraged this morning. Father, I pray for those on their way here who are coming for our class and for our worship assembly in just a little bit. Uh, be with them as they travel. Be with those that are home, sick, uh, and those that are not feeling well this morning. Pray for them as well. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, as is customary for me, I tend to ask a lot of really personal questions. And so you'll get, you get used to it. Uh, in fact, there's often so personal people don't want to raise their hands because they don't want to tell people that information. <laughs> well, this is not necessarily that way this morning. My first question is, when it comes to communicating with friends and with relatives, are you more of a phone call kind of a person, an emailer? Do you like to write letters? Do you text those people? Or are you a let's go visit kind of person? When it comes to communicating with your friends and relatives, what do you prefer and why? What do you prefer? I'm missing one? Oh, all of, all of the above. Okay, or maybe you're an all of the above kind of a person. Lou, and we got a microphone we're going to be passing around, so make sure to, yeah, don't, don't overtax Jim here. I'm an all, all together, every, I, I do everything. Everything, okay. And, um. But there's one thing that is not up there. I talk to strangers a lot. Okay. People who don't know me. 
So you include strangers in this, not just friends and relatives. Right. Okay. What else? Back here. It kind of depends on what. If it's just wanting information back and forth, I prefer texting. But okay. if it's just a visit, I prefer a phone call or face-to-face, -face. preferably face-to-face. Okay. -face. Yeah. All right. What else? Who else? I guess raise your hand if you are a, oh, in the back, right there. Me personally, I'm more of a phone call guy, only because I think that my generation has gotten into texting a lot, and you can't really feel the emotion behind the conversation. Sure. Yeah, when it comes to a personal communication, a text or an email just doesn't quite do it, does it? You don't get the inflection, the voice inflection. Sometimes, I don't know, do, you, do any of you know people who, who type in all capital letters? It, it looks like they're yelling at you the whole time, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's an unusual form of uh, communication. You know, that's the thing. Is I think we prefer, when it comes to friends and family, to actually see them or, or to talk to them because we want them to understand our emotion, our, our care for them, rather than to just send a quick message. I mean, I text my brother all the time, but it's not the same as actually talking to him. Uh, it changes it, right? Yeah, down, down in front here. When we're talking about communication, we need to also specify the kind of communication. Sure. If it's just something that's short that you're trying to give information or get yeah. information. Right then some of those things actually work really well. Yeah. But if it's something very personal, I think a death in the family or a birth in the family. Right. The situation calls for something different. It does. So it's very situational. That's why I said all of the above. Yeah. Simply because there are situations where you need to be in person. Right. Versus a phone call or a text or an email. Sometimes distance creates the problem where that's the only way you got to do, it. and I think that's what Paul was doing. Was yeah. this was the best he could do from where he was? Sure. At. Yeah, the situation demands a different kind of communication, right? What about this second question here to, to begin off this series? If you were to write a long distance letter to your church family, what God honoring traits and practices would you praise? What would you What would you say about your church? family or to your church family to show them honor that they are they are doing something honorable what would you say to them if you were writing a letter to them ah dave yeah i would uh, draw attention to their love for one another for the love if i've heard of that you know i would okay. i would say i i hear good things about you that you love each other yeah that you love each other Okay. Down here, Phil. Jim. Down here. Front of you, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would acknowledge their love of the study of Scripture because if we see that, it would be like the Bereans. You know, they were noble and they were called out as being noble people because. They were kind of relentless in trying to figure things out by sure. studying the scriptures. That seems like a worthy trait. Yeah, yeah. Honor them for their love of scriptures and honoring the scriptures. As you said, the Bereans, uh, who were called more, more noble than those in Thessalonica, the ones we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. I would say one thing that we need to remember about any church is how they treat the strangers and the people that are visiting. Okay. Their love for those. I, I use our church as an example. You were invited in, and we are glad to have you here. It's yeah. a practice that needs to be more than just because we're fellow Christians. It needs to be right. a practice of bringing people to Christ because we care about them. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes, Jim. <laughs> I was thinking uh, if I had something hard to say to them, difficult, something they needed to hear that they might not want to hear, I don't think I would start with that. Okay. And Paul is a great example of someone who has hard things to say, say, for instance, to the Corinthians, yet he starts out with some positives. He sees the positives in that group. Right. Yeah. You want to begin with the positives so that maybe they can hear the negatives, right? Yeah. Down here in front. Sorry, Jim. He's going to get his exercise this morning. Well, I certainly couldn't write with the authority of an apostle. Yeah. But much on mine today, I think you need to uh, caution the congregation that in our society today, uh, the kind of um, alertness that the apostle Paul also often uh, expressed with those kind of challenges the church would be facing. And I think in our society today, there's great effort to push those who are believers in Christ into directions that we just can't go. Yeah. And we need to be prepared for that and do our best to be ready to respond. Go ahead and pass it down there to Lou. When I, when I started on week here, really across the country, I had to write um, back to some of the places I'd been. And the first thing I said in the letter was, thank you for loving me. It is hard to love Lou. And it is, because I lived a really tough life trying to get to Christ. And sometimes I'm not completely understood. But yeah. I, I, I'll tell you, I feel the love, especially of this church, Metro and Eastside. They're doing the right things at the right time for an evangelist. And I thank them. Okay. Well, thank you, Lou. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to enter into this letter now and talk about Thessalonica for a little bit. You know, Paul, he carried on his shoulders an overwhelming burden, this responsibility that he was given, and this care that he had for all the churches in the New Testament. You know, in view of such heavy responsibilities, it must have been refreshing for Paul to minister to the Thessalonian Christians. You know, these people... He called them, he deemed them worthy of commendation, and he encouraged them very much because of their encouragement. You know, Paul, he begins this first letter with a recognition of their Christian virtues. He arranged them under a couple of categories here. The Thessalonians' present condition, their, their present condition, which included things like a faith that works, a love that labors, a steadfastness of hope. And we're going to read that in the passage this morning. And then he, the second uh, category he uses here is their past conversion, which included all of these things, a reception of the gospel and power in the Holy Spirit, a genuine imitation of the Lord, a joyful endurance and tribulation, a behavior that exemplifies all believers, a proclamation of the word everywhere, a total transformation from idolatry, and then they had an expectant looking for the return of Christ. And so between these two lists, Paul pauses to affirm his understanding that the church in Thessalonica was part of God's kingdom. He wanted to recognize that. Much of this first letter to the Thessalonians, it was a recap of what they had witnessed when they were there together in Acts chapter 17 that we'll read in just a moment. He repeats their shared story of faithful repentance and belief, and then the persecution that both Paul and his companions had faced when they were there, but also the persecution that the believers in Thessalonica faced when they could not find Paul. It was turned on towards them when 
Paul and his companions escaped. So what we know about this letter is that the author was Paul, the Apostle Paul. 1 Thessalonians is considered one of his earliest epistles, if not the first. With our reading of the letter and from Acts, we're going to learn that Paul wrote this letter soon after arriving in Corinth on his second missionary journey, which would date 1 Thessalonians between 51 and 52 AD. And archaeologically, it was verified by an inscription on the Temple of Apollos at Delphi near Corinth, which dates Gallio's service as proconsul in Achaia to the same dates. And so let's read a a little bit of Acts chapter 17. We're going to read verses 1 through 5, and then verses 10 and 11. And then we're going to turn over to 1 Thessalonians and read chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Something I wanted to say before we read, though, is that what I would like to encourage you to do every week is to read through each of the letters that we're going to be reading. And so hopefully, whoever's teaching, and I'll try to be the example here, (laughs) we'll let you know which one's coming. That way you know which one to read. Uh, Being that we're reading 1 Thessalonians, we're going to read 2 Thessalonians next week. Um, The other cool thing I think the the neat part of these letters is that it doesn't take very long to read very most of them some of them are a little longer first Corinthians is definitely longer Romans is longer but it doesn't take very long to read these I went online to find a uh, chart I've seen these charts many times before of the amount of time it takes on average for someone to read each of the letters And while we're not going to read all of 1 Thessalonians this morning, I encourage you to do that this week. Read 1 Thessalonians, read through it. On average, it takes 11 minutes to read the entire letter of 1 Thessalonians. 11 minutes. That's not very long. Uh, And then 2 Thessalonians, we are going to read all of that together here next Sunday. But I encourage you to read ahead. It only takes 7 minutes to read through 2 Thessalonians. I think we can use seven minutes to read through that letter next Sunday. Uh, As I've already wasted a lot of time here, we're not going to read through all of 1 Thessalonians together. We'll read part of it. But I want to encourage you to read each of these letters each week. So let's start in in, in Acts chapter 17. We're going to read verses 1 through 5, and then 10 through 11, and then we'll turn over to 1 Thessalonians. Acts 17, starting in verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis excuse me, and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a a mob, set the city in, in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. Now skip down to verse 10. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Remember, that was their custom. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Now, let's turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. This is more um, about who it was that was with Paul and about why he was writing this letter. Uh, some of their history with the Thessalonian church. 1 Thessalonians 3, starting in verse 1. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this, For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it had come to pass, and just as you you know. 
For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. So Paul had traveled from Thessalonica to Berea and then to Athens. And so I tried to underline those places on the map. Hopefully you can see them. It's so tiny. It's hard to find a good map that you could zoom in on. So he sent them to, uh, they went to Berea, then to Athens, then to Corinth. And Paul helped establish this church with the help of Silas and of Timothy. Paul located the synagogue. That was his custom, as the passage told us. He would go into these new places and he would speak with the Jews in the synagogue. In the case of Thessalonica, he spent three Sabbaths reasoning with them about Jesus. Some of them were persuaded, including a number of these devout Greeks and some of these women. The unbelieving Jews, they became jealous of Paul. They created an uproar in that city, and that's when they left for Berea. They had to escape. And it seems that a strong church was established there. Mostly Gentile church members, and some of those were these, Jason and Aristarchus and Secundus. Uh, these were some of the more well-known members of that church there. A little bit about Thessalonica. It was the capital and the largest city of the Roman province of Macedonia. It was on a major road from Rome to the eastern provinces, and Thessalonica served as a center of trade and commerce in that area. And it's known today as Thessaloniki or Salonica. So let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 10, and then we'll dive into this text a little bit to talk about why, why did Paul write this letter to them? He was just with them. So let's read this. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. And how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. All right, so diving into this text a little bit. Some of the companions of Paul. He, in verse 1, says, this letter is from him, but it is also from Silvanus or Silvanus. Uh, I don't know how you would pronounce that, but... This is also, also known as Silas. Uh, that's, this is another name for him. Uh, he's a companion of Paul on this second missionary journey. We can read through Acts chapter 15 through 18 and see that he was with him. And later he was a, a writer for Peter. And we read that in 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, again, he's also called Silas. So we know that si Silas was with him. Also Timothy. We read about Timothy, Paul's most notable disciple. This is the one that we hear about the most and who even has letters written to him. This, this man traveled on the second and third missionary journeys and stayed near Paul during his first Roman imprisonment. Later, he served in Ephesus, and he spent some time in prison himself. And while he was in Ephesus, he was sent there to appoint elders in that congregation. 
Paul's first letter to Timothy while he was ministering in the church at Ephesus instructed him regarding this life in the church, what, what it would look like. And in his second letter to Timothy, as he faced death and was about to turn his ministry over to Timothy, Paul called Timothy to be strong and faithfully to preach. And here in 1 Thessalonians, we read that Timothy was sent to Thessalonica after Paul and Silas had to escape as their lives were in danger. So I asked this question, why would Paul knowingly send Timothy back to Thessalonica knowing what they had gone through and, and knowing that there were people that were very angry and would probably try to kill Timothy too? Why would he send him there intentionally? And so I asked this with these sub-questions, is there ever a time to go into a dangerous place for the gospel? And is there ever a time to refrain from this kind of ministry? So why would Paul send Timothy back to Thessalonica knowing what had happened there? Why would he do that down here? Though I believe there are times when things aren't dangerous, I think we live in dangerous times right now. Mm -hmm. Anything could happen to us. Sure. I think Timothy went in with knowledge, knowing how dangerous this place was. He was with Paul, mm -hmm. but Paul was worried. He didn't want the Thessalonians to fall away. Okay. He didn't want them to be discouraged. And I think in that case, being so new, it was a good thing for him to send Timothy there. Okay. As for refraining, we're not asked to refrain at all. Okay. <laughs> okay. Phil? The, there was always a danger for Paul, and he knew that. And he, he came to kind of embrace that. In fact, that was, I think somehow it was like part of his ministry was delivering the understanding that when you come into these things, it can be a, a good thing, you know, in, in the scheme, in God's scheme. And so he, you know, he was beat up. He was nearly killed. He was always being chased from here to there. And I think what he's saying to Timothy is, you know, take a page from this, you know, taste of this. Mm -hmm. Because I've taught you these things, this kind of suffering that I'm putting you into, can be a good thing and he loved these people and he didn't want to uh, just leave them and so Timothy has this opportunity to step into the fray okay yeah Rhonda. the question for me is how would Timothy grow in his faith without facing those types of trials mm. So how do we grow in our faith without facing our own? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, this, this was a time of maturing for Timothy, was it not? A time for him to learn some things about ministry, about especially, you know, what I've heard so far is that there's this love for this church and these new Christians, these new followers, new believers in, in Christ you don't want to leave them and abandon them just because you faced a little bit of hardship. You want to make sure that they're still being cared for. And that takes someone to have to go back. Paul certainly couldn't go back. He shows his face. They just, they'll attack him as soon as he gets there. But they don't know this Timothy guy. Who's he? <laughs> yeah. This is just an observation, but from the stuff that I've read in the book of Acts, you see this pattern over and over. Yeah. where Paul will send one of his uh, uh, partners back. And I think maybe uh, when they go back, they don't take such a public stance. Sure. They probably go back to, like, reinforce and strengthen the church. Yeah. And for some reason also, the focus of the Jews' ire was always Paul because he was the prominent speaker. Yeah. And so if one of these other people went back and sort of flew under the radar, they could strengthen the church and reaffirm what Paul said without necessarily becoming a target. Mm -hmm. But that is just a matter of conjecture on my part. 
I happen to agree with that, yeah. Well, in verse 2, we read that uh, he says that, you know, we always, we're thankful that, that God has you in our hearts because we are constantly mentioning you in our prayers. You know, these companions of Paul, him and his companions, they prayed frequently for the entire flock there in Thessalonica. And three of those prayers are offered within this letter that, that we can read if we read through the whole letter. We'll read those prayers in these verses that are on the screen. Um, he's constantly mentioning them in his prayers to God. Think about that. You know, I would love for people to constantly remember me in their prayers. How about you? That, that would be a blessing, wouldn't it? And that's what Paul is telling them. I, I do this all the time because I want you under God's care. And so I ask this question number four. Paul reports praying for these Thessalonians always, remembering them without ceasing. How does a Christian pray without ceasing? And why would you pray for someone, a church, or even this church, so diligently? How do you pray without ceasing, and why would you do that? Lou down front here. Sorry, he's in the back. <laughs> oh. Everything that comes my way, or I'm trying to do, Lord, the Lord is in my, in my mind before I do anything. And I believe that's pray without ceasing but because you can't live without the Lord even a minute of the day. Yeah. And, and when I pray for the church, I pray hard stuff because how does the church grow? Talking to other people. So as we talk to other people and show that God has changed us into things that some people might just say, well, I need to talk to you more because I'm going through that. And maybe we can get them to a point to understand the gospel. Okay. And, and that's a hard prayer because today's society is a, is, a, is a society of political rightness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you might have missed, what he said before he got the microphone was, how could you not pray without ceasing? <laughs> how could you not? You know, we need the Lord so, so much in our lives. And to not pray every day, all day, just talking to him, is something we all need to be doing. Uh, how can we not do that? You know, as I get older, I, I'm, you know, people will say, oh, how, how do you pray all day? I can, only, I can only go five minutes and then that's enough. I can't, I don't know what else to say. But you start to realize that it's an ongoing just conversation with God. That I, I just need to talk to him, ask him for help through the things that I'm dealing with. If I get a weird thought in my head, asking him, hey, you know, what's going on with this? Why am I thinking about this? These are the things that we end up talking with God about all the time. Tom, he's coming. <clears throat> uh, I, when you say, uh, why would you pray for someone, a church, this church, does that mean the Thessalonica church? It could be Thessalonica, it could be this church. Well, they had a special, yeah, and I guess this is uh, where I was going with this, is the fact that they had a special issue going on and that's you ask the question of why would he send Timothy back there well they're undergoing persecution right and if they're undergoing persecution and you want to comfort them and help them why would you not be willing to undergo the same thing yeah and so when whenever there's uh I, th I think when there's something a little major going on, not that we shouldn't pray for things that aren't major, 
but when, when there's something major going on, like a persecution, that's on our mind all the time. Just think about when the church, churches in uh, Croatia yeah. were being attacked by the Russians. Uh, th that was on our mind all the time, and we were praying about it all the time. And I think that's that may be what is that may that's I, th those are the things that kind of stick with you all the time. Yeah, similar there are, circumstances. There are things when uh, would you pray for my safe travel to uh, Dallas? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I may pray once. I may not pray 24 hours a day for your safe travel to Dallas. You know, you know. See, uh, see what I'm saying? Yes. Not yeah. that's not important. It is. Right. But uh, the things that are more urgent. I think they're easier to keep on our mind constantly. Yeah. Yeah, we want to continue to think of things, think of people who are going through these difficult hardships, right? Yeah. Let's go, let's go on a little bit more. We're definitely not going to get through all of this this morning. Um, you know, this is, this is tough to teach a class on one whole book of the Bible <laughs> and to be able to talk about it and go through every verse, but we'll get through as much as we can here. Uh, verse 3, he talks about remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is an important passage in 1 Thessalonians. There's this threefold combination of faith, hope, and love that Paul is very commonly known for. He writes about this in many places throughout Scripture, throughout his letters. Paul refers here to the fulfillment of ministry duties which resulted from these spiritual attitudes in particular. And, you know, I, I think about that with all the mentions of faith, hope, hope, and love in his letters and why that was so important. Um, I had to ask, why are faith, hope, and love so important to Paul and the Christian witness here on earth? Why is faith, hope, and love so important to our witness? In reference to this, Paul spells it out in Corinthians. Love is central to all of this. If we have the love that God has, we are going to have hope and faith because mm -hmm. we know he is the power in control no matter what. Mm -hmm. But these things are central and core to who we have to be in order to be faithful imitators of Christ. And that's why he's very much saying these things. Christ brings us hope. He gives us faith, and he shows us how to love. And that is why it's so important to be a witness of that kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he mentions it. Oh, go ahead, Jim. I shared with a brother uh, this week a verse, uh, a sentence from a book that I'm reading. Uh, the sentence is, very few people live with love at the center of their lives. Paul. Yeah. Yeah, this is very important to him. You know, I, I looked at this word steadfastness, this patience that Paul talks about here. It's such a, a deeper thing than our English word for this. You know, this this word, this term, it talks about this condition of staying or remaining faithful under pressure. And that's who we are as Christians. We're called to hold fast to our hope to the end, no matter what happens to us. Uh, several have mentioned about the times that we are in right now and how we really do need to be thinking about that, being steadfastness, steadfast in our faith. That steadfastness is more than just sitting and waiting. Just more than just patience. It is active. It is telling people. Saying, this is my hope. This is why I have this hope. And to be active out in, in the world and talking to people about that. Uh, that is what this word really, truly means. Let's, uh, let's move forward here a little bit. Um, up on the screen, we see in verse 5, our gospel. He calls this message our gospel. He's sharing that. It was not just his gospel or Christ's gospel. It was for him. 
It was for all sinners, for all time, for everyone to believe, and especially for him to preach this message. And so he calls it our gospel. But he knew it didn't originate with him. And so he'll say that this is also the gospel of God. And he also says this is the gospel of Christ. But he says this is our gospel. This is our good news. And we need to hear this good news. He said this didn't come just in word, but it came through the power of the Holy Spirit and in full conviction. This gospel had come in word in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 17. We can read about that. But not in word only, but also in the Holy Spirit power and in confidence and conviction. This is a a good message, a good news message, and they needed to spread this message. He also says that you know what kind of men we prove to be among you. And they would know that because of the witness that Paul had given and the way that he didn't try to fight back. He left when they were chasing him out of town. And this quality of of this message was confirmed by his character and in the lives of the others that were with him. Uh, Let's see. We only have a few minutes, so I'm going to skip ahead here. Pardon the screen here. Uh, Let's see. Where do I want to go? All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to read this last bit. Oh, I don't have it on there. All right. Uh, yeah, read 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 28. I want to read that. He gives a great summation in this letter of what he wants them to hear. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 28. He says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What are these final instructions about? Why does Paul end this letter with all of these very specific things? Is there one thing on this list you find very insightful or impacting to you? Boo down here. Admonish. We should be talking to each other and admonishing us when we are not doing the right things. When we are slow at doing what God wants us to do. We all have a plan. Do we all look for that plan? And that And that plan is so important to the church because if I need one thing, I should know where to get it. And admonishing people, getting them to think about who they really are and what they should be doing is so important to the church. Anyone else find anything interesting, insightful about this passage? Jim, right down here. Oh, what's that? Oh, come on back there. Where's his name? Oh, okay, yeah. Yep. 
Um, I think uh, as you're reading it all, it's things that are um, he's asking you to keep, like um, avoid evil and cling to what's good. And all those things are things we strive for, but they're, they're hard. It's hard to do, and it seems weighted when it's on us. But I love when it says the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. And then it takes the, it's not our power, it's God's power that's going to get us through it. Okay. God's power, it's not all on us. But these are good things to remember as we think about this idea of being able to, to live this life in those situations. Go ahead, David. Uh, verse 14 that ends with the idea of being patient with everyone. Mm -hmm. He, he, he tells you to take into account what kind of person you're dealing with. In other words, you need to sort of know them, but there's a different kind of encouragement or action that you take with each of those three types of people that are mentioned there. So you need to sort of tailor what you say, yeah. couch it in love, you know, and really the only way you can do that well is uh, if you invite the Spirit to yeah. guide you in that. And so prayer is, you know, behind all of that. Yeah, be be patient with people. <laughs> we need to, right? It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we might read in the news about these revivals happening where there's thousands of people that are being baptized in one place. And we wonder, when's that going to happen here? You know, <laughs> like, well, let's be patient. We got to be patient. It doesn't always happen that way. That's the exception, not the rule. Yeah. Um, I noticed that a lot of us got a lot of good and blessings just reading part of the uh, epistle to the Hebrew people. Um, and I believe that's in chapter 11. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, mm -hmm. the proof of things not seen. Yeah. And then from Galatians, uh, you know, you, you learn something that, that can be saving and invaluable. It says, circumcision and uncircumcision profits nothing, but faith that worketh through love. And there I see that it means something when faith is working through love because of the power of God and, and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit rather than just talk. Yeah, yeah. Well, I encourage you to read through this whole letter this week. But I also encourage you to read 2 Thessalonians. We're going to talk about that one next week. And so I encourage you to read through 2 Thessalonians. It'll take you a total of 18 minutes to read both of those letters. Uh, not a long time. I encourage you to do it a couple of times. That way you can really read through and, and pick out the things that maybe you didn't see the first time. And see what Paul was writing to this church. Uh, I do want to end with this idea of waiting. You know, in chapter 1, verse 10, he says to wait. Wait for his son from heaven. This is what Paul wanted them to remember, is that Jesus is coming back, and you need to be waiting for him. Waiting in anticipation to expect him to come back. And so I, I just want to end with that and think about that as we get ready for our worship assembly this morning. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>